Hello class, um, welcome to the CS111 midterm review. Um, I'm posting a video of this online so you guys can look at this during your free time this weekend. Um, feel free to email me if you have any questions or anything. Um, again, this is a harder version of your test. Um, so if you could do this, uh, you should be fine with our test. Um, things may change a little bit, you know, different styles and stuff, but um, it would be about the same guideline and length. So let's get started here. Um, typically on the first section I usually do some sort of true-false matching or something like that. Um, so basically here's a bunch of true-false questions and let's just go through them. Uh, number one, an integer in Java is represented by three bytes. Uh, as you recall, um, in our first lecture and some things after that, um, it can go from two or two billion to negative two billion, which, if you expand that out, is two to the thirty-second, which means that there would need to be uh, four bytes of information for an integer in Java. So the correct answer here is true. Um, Java can run on any computer with a JVM um, or a CPU, so that's a central processing unit, and basically you need an OS, and a JVM stands for Java Virtual Machine, so as long as it, the OS runs the virtual machine, you should be good. So that's also a true statement. A Java com program compiles down to machine instructions. Uh, as you recall, when we compile Java, it doesn't actually go into machine instructions because it gets run by the JVM, which converts what we call bytecode into machine instructions. So uh, there's that extra step there, but so this uh, 3 is false. It compiles into bytecode. Um, this one's a little tricky usually. Um, so here, true does not equal false, and that's a true statement. So I'm asking you actually validate the truthness or falseness of a statement. Final memorable member variables must be initialized before they are used and cannot be modified. Uh, remember, final is kind of, once you set it, you can't change it, so that is also true. Um, it's also used typically for constants in our program. So we have the following piece of code will compile. We have a double A, a double B, and then the integer of sum equals A plus B. Uh, that will not compile due to the fact that A and B are decimal, and they won't allow you to get into uh, or assign that down to a sum. So th th that statement is false. So let's mark that false. Next one, the first index number of a string is 1. Um, we've talked about this a few times and shown pictures where the index of the first character starts, we start our counting at 0. So we go up from 0. So the first index should be 0, not 1. So that's also false. Uh, the switch statement only works with characters, integers, short, or byte data types. Um, this can actually go true or false um, depending on the version of Java you're using. If you're using 1.6 and before, that's true. However, in 1.7, they switched it to string. So uh, for our class, we're going to say that's, that's false because we're uh, using 1.7 or higher. The break statement can allow you to explicitly exit a loop. Uh, we showed that last class, and that's a true statement. Here we have max being set equal to the ternary operator of 4 is greater than 3. Um, so first we need to evaluate whether 4 is greater than 3. That's a true statement. Then the value after the question mark is the truth, is the truth value. Uh, the colon is the false value. Therefore... Uh, we would get 
we would do the truth value since the 4 is greater than 3. So 0 is then assigned to max, and max is set equal to, and then so the max equals equals to 4 would be false. And finally, we have a double or quotation mark. Quotation mark is a valid string in Java. Um, we had a, a whole pitfall section with this, and if you read the book, it talks about it with the get line and uh, or with the scanner class and the next line and the next statement. Uh, basically, an uh, empty string is what this is called, and it is a valid string in Java. It just doesn't have any character data associated with it. So there's our section one complete. Okay, continuing on with section two of the of the test is we have a little Java class here called Mystery and. Um, this code is valid and we're run uh, and we need to figure out the output of this program as we're running so let's take it from the top and look at what's happening we declare two variables integers row and column row we set that equal to five and column is undefined as of now so we go down and go to the first while loop where row is greater than or equal to one uh, that's a true statement for the first one because uh, row is 5, so we go down. So now we're going to set our column to 1, and then we're going to execute another while statement here. So we see that the column, which is 1, is less than or equal to 3. Good. Our row, which is declared outside, is 5. So if row modded by 2, uh, which means uh, that's how, what's the remainder of that? So 5 modded by 2 should equal 1. So that is a true statement, which then causes us to go into here. So our first character would be that. We would then jump down, increment column by 1, and uh, the next is the end of the bracket, so we would go back up to here. The columns would equal to 2, which is less than or equal to 3. Again, the row value hasn't changed in between the while loop, so we would also go into the true statement up here and we would print out the character to the left again, or the, the less than character. Uh, we then increment it column to three. We then go back up. Column three is less than or equal to three. That's a true statement. Again, row hasn't changed, so we again output a less than symbol. We then go down, increment column to 4, go back up to our loop, compare 4 is now gr greater than th or less than 3, so that statement is false. So we would exit our loop. Uh, we would decrement row, and then we would print, do a print line, which would just move our cursor down to the next line. I apologize if this looks like a double space. Uh, it's just one kind of how Word operates um, without changing settings here. So uh, going back, we are now we did our printout. We're at the bottom of the while loop of the outer while loop. So we go back up to the top. Row is now equal to four, which is again still greater than one. Uh, we reset column to one. Uh, column is less than three, so we enter our while loop. Now, 4 modded by 2 is not equal to 0, so the statement's false. So we would go to the second print, which would do uh, a greater than symbol. We again increment column, go back up to the top. And to speed this up, you're going to see that each time we go through our loop here, it's going to be acting the same way as it did on that first time except each of the statements inside the loop, which is the one that controls the printing, the, the row modulo by 2, that's always going to be false. Therefore, we always will get, we will get uh, three greater than symbols in a row just versus the three less than symbols in a row from the first loop. So if we do that, uh, we execute that three times, 
we then come to the bo bottom of our loop, we decrement row again, and we do a printout line, so we increment to the next line, we go up, so 3 is still greater than 1, we reset our column to 1, column is now less than 3, so we enter our loop, now we compare our, we do our row again, and we see that row 3 modded by 2 is in fact now true again, so we're going to do our less than symbols, and you can probably see a little pattern developing here, where each time we would go to th doing the column 1, 2, and 3, and then when it gets, column goes to 4, we would exit our while loop, the inner while loop, but that the row value doesn't change for each of those three loops. Therefore, we get the same three truth statements, which will do three less than symbols in a row. Again, we will exit our loop of the inner while loop and go to our outer while loop, which is right here. We'll decrement the row from three to two, do another printout line, and then we're at the bottom of our outer while loop. So two is still greater than or equal to one, We'll set reset one, go into our while loop, and then since row is equal to two, the modulo of that is zero, which will cause us to do greater than symbols. And it follows the same three s steps, or three loops, where we go to column, once column equals greater than four, which will happen after the third completed loop, we'll exit our inner loop, go to our outer and decrement row from two to one, We'll do another printout line here, and we'll go back up to our outer while loop. So now here on our last time, row is greater than or equal to 1. That's a true statement. So we'll enter our loop again, uh, go into our loop. W 1 modulo 2 is in fact 1. So we'll get into our first loop here, which will be our uh, less than symbol. and based upon what we've seen before, that should be executed three times. Once column goes to four, this statement fails, which will cause us to exit our inner loop, decrement row from one, from one to zero. We'll do another printout line, and then we'll go back to, we'll exit our outer loop and go back up to here. This time we'll say row is zero, which is not greater than or equal to one. Therefore, we'll exit our while loop, go down to here. There's nothing to execute, and we'll essentially be done with our program. So, the three lines that we, sh or the five lines that we output are three characters each. Each of the lines are three characters, alternating, be each line alternating between three less than symbols followed by three greater than symbols. Um, and that happens for five lines. So that's our answer for section number two here. On to section three. For this section, uh, we're going to consider the code segments of three different fragments of code. Um, each section, each fragment will compile if written in a larger program, um, and they essentially test the three different types of looping, looping mechanisms that we've uh, covered so far in the course. Uh, X is a for loop, Y is a while loop, and Z is a do while loop. Um, so let's consider fragment X, which is the for loop. Here we have int, the uh, initialization int i equals zero. We go, run i our evaluation, or our, our Boolean expression is i is less than 5, and for each update, or each time through the loop, we're going to increment i by 1. For fragment x, we're going to do a printout of i each time through. So for the first value of i, we're going to print out uh, 0. We're going to go back through increment i, uh, compare it to 5, i is now 1, uh, that's true, so we're going to go through uh, and print out i again, so 1 here, we're going to go to the bottom of our loop, increment i to 2, test 2 with, 2 is in fact less than 5, 
So we're going to print out 2. Uh, we're going to then increment i from 2 to 3. 3 is less than 5, so we're going to print out uh, 3. We're going to go back through and increment i to 4. 4 is less than 5, so we're going to print out 4. Uh, at the bottom of the loop, we're going to increment i to 5. We're going to test 5 is not less than uh, 5. Therefore, that is done. So fragment X is 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. For fragment Y, we're going to now do it as a while loop. So we have, uh, we set I equal to 0. We're going to do while I is less than 5. So we're going to print out here, uh, print line I, which is going to be 0. Then we're going to increment i by 1 to 1. Go through and check. i is 1, i which is 1 is less than 5. So we're going to enter our loop. We're going to print out 1 and go down to our next value. Uh, here we're going to test i as 2 is less than 5, so that's true. We're going to print out 2 increment i to 3, test i, 3 is less than 5, therefore we're going to print out 3, increment i to 4, test 4 is less than 5, so that's true, enter our loop, uh, print out 4, increment 4 to 5, 5 is not less than 5, so we now exit our loop. So x fragment X and fragment Y were the same. And now we're going to uh, go into out fragment Z. Uh, this will compile, so um, no worries about that. Uh, here we have int I is equal to zero, do a do while statement. So here we're going to actually increment I first, uh, and these are all, this will actually compile. So I will be uh, executed first, so we'll go from 0 to 1, and then we print out the statement. So here, we're going to print out 1 first, uh, and then go down and compare I, which is 1, is less than 5. We're going to go back up. We're going to increment I to 2, uh, print that out, and test that. 2 is less than 5. We're good. Go back through, increment I to 3, print 3 out and then test 3 is less than 5, so we're good. Go back in, uh, four, we're going to increment i to 4, print that out, and then we're going to compare 4 with less than 5, that's true. True. Here we're going to increment i to 5, uh, print 5 out, and then we're going to compare 5, with, which is less than 5, and that is in fact uh, false, so we're going to exit our do while loop. So there's our three fragments, X, Y, and Z, um, and what their values are. Okay, section four is a pretty quick section here, a few multiple choice uh, questions. Um, so let's just go through each one. Which one of the following is not a correct variable name? Um, here, you would kind of have to know what is not good, but looking at this, we can kind of narrow it down. Um, B and C are pretty much all characters, so that leaves us with kind of A and D. Um, the difference here is if you look, D starts with the character of Y, and A starts with the character of 2, which is a number. Um, and based on the fact that B and C are all characters, we should kind of maybe guess that since 2, the number 2 is a character, is different, is that the most likely answer here is that A is the bad, is not a correct verbal name, and that is in fact true. Okay, so we have a particular uh, piece of data and that's not a primitive type. Uh, therefore, 
uh, the other current terminology that we use for data is um, based upon this. So if it's not primitive data and holds information, it's either an object, a number, a literal, or a boolean. Uh, we know that booleans are primitives, so that can't be the answer. Um, literal and number, literal we've never talked about really, uh, however it is a term in your book and part of the vocabulary. Um, and then number is not a particular primitive type, uh, or that primitives are different types of numbers, but there is nothing that we've called a number per se. The other pieces of information that we had is an object, and we've seen that objects like strings hold certain pieces of data. Um, so the best answer for that is an object. Oh, uh, here is question three. Um, this is a typo. This should be four negative four. I guess I had an old version of test before um, I had to correct it. So anyways, um, we didn't cover this and basically if you want if you do negative 32 modulo 6 into Google, you'll get the answer of 4. Uh, the reason for this is basically what you need to do is multiply, or how many multiples of 6 that are positive would cause the number to go from negative to positive. So we would need 6 multiples of 6, so thir value of 36 to move that number positive. So it would be a, a negative 6 and because of that um, the answer for the modulo is 36 minus 32 gives us a 4 so the answer here is C. Uh, however this should not be on the test and don't expect it to be. Okay, we've talked a lot about, for the next one, objects, and it's how we use methods and objects. So you need to piece together. So we invoke the method length and the object reference by stir, and we want to store the value in val. So based upon A, B, C, and D, um, they all assign the value to val. They just have different um, orientations of length and stir together. So we have our object stir and we need to invoke the me method length on it. So as you recall we have objects and then we to invoke methods we use what's called dot notation so a period. Uh, since there's no period in D, we can automatically rule out D, so that leaves us A, B, and C. Uh, and we use dot notation followed by the method name. Uh, the method name for B and C comes first, so that would tend to give us the answer of A. So we have the object stir, and we want to invoke the method length on it, so stir dot length will then determine the length of the stir variable, or the string object, in store in stir and assign that length to val which is the correct answer here is a okay so we've learned several different um, ways to format strings um, number format decimal format printf and all this stuff so basically this was just one of the uh, we have several different ways of formatting strings and this was just asking for one of those. So uh, we could probably guess because there's three formats in there that that's probably the most likely answer. Um, and then we have two decimals. So if you should remember that decimal format should be the correct answer but you sh maybe should guess that from also just test taking skills of seeing that there's two decimals and three formats so that would probably be the most likely one but um, yeah decimal format is the correct value for that
one. Okay guys, uh, next is section 5, and for section 5 you actually have to write little statements of code. Um, while I'm not looking for 100% correctness on all the brackets and parentheses, you should have a good idea of how to use each thing, and if you forget like a semicolon or something, that's understandable because you don't have an actual compiler here. However, you should get a, it fairly close to what would work with maybe one or two small minor errors. So for each of these we're looking for different um, statements. So for part one, um, what we want here is we want to uh, basically capitalize every other letter of a string. Um, so we're going to have our what I'm going to do is create basically two strings. One is a base which is the actual string, so enjoy the weather. Next I'm going to create a new string uh, to actually hold the new word. And since uh, here it says I have to write a for loop, so I'm going to create a for loop here for int i equals zero. Again, some of this is related to how word works. i is less than, so I want to go all the way up to the, the end of the string, so, and not including the last letter because remember our counting here starts at zero. So I want to do base.length, and we've already seen both uh, the length used on the last slide, so uh, hopefully we got that right and we would do that here and then what we want to do here is typically we increment i by one however here we want to start at, at let's look at the letters that we want to increment here so here I'm actually starting at zero but if I look at what I'm uh, what the string is enjoy the weather um, the first character I actually want to change to uh, capitalize every other letter is uh, the first letter. Um, however, it may be best to go through and create a new string without that. So I have to kind of think about how I want to do this. Um, here what I think I'll do is um, we've already seen how the modulo is used and what I want to do here is since I only, only want to grab every other letter I want to use the modulo of our variable i to compute what letters get capitalized. So in this case I do want to increment it by one each time through and here what I want to do is I want to put a little uh, statement here so if i modded by two if i is modded by 2 and that is equal to 1 then I want to basically append the character to our new string which is basically the base dot the char at i and if it's equal to one, which would be every odd letter, basically I want to take that and make it an uppercase. Um, I don't think there's not a char uppercase here, so what I could do is just set this up to a temp string. which should that should convert it into a string from a character which then will allow me to uppercase that string so using the method here to uppercase and then I can just append that into my new string actually I should just probably move that into it 
because that returns a new string and remember we don't actually modify strings when we do these methods uh, for string because they're immutable so that should create us a new uh, character which should be uppercase um, elf we can simply take our character at so we want to take new string plus equals our base dot char at and just move that over So that would be our basic uh, statement of everything. So uh, it would look something like that. Um, and again, this might not be 100% correct because I believe I would need to assign string to be uh, something, not null. Otherwise, I would get a null pointer exception for various things, especially maybe here. Um, basically, so this we go through. Uh, basically, we're going to go from zero the first letter in the string through the end of the string if we have a odd letter based upon the index so remember we start at zero so we start at zero one two three and so forth so if we're if we have an odd letter we want to take that letter and basically make it uppercase and append it to our string if we have an even letter we just take whatever the character was at that spot and append it to uh, the string that we're creating Okay, so that would be uh, section one, uh, five, question one. For section, uh, or for part two, um, we actually did this in class the other night, so I'm not going to actually do question two because we this was one of our lab statements that we had to do. Um, so just review that section, and I believe you should be able to find this in the book, um, if not. Uh, I'm just going to reduce some spaces here so I have a little bit more room to do three and four here. So write a while loop that would validate whether or not a T was inputted. Um, we also did this in class, however, I do think that this is valid. So um, I'm going to just write a little comment here that says assume the scanner and keyboard are initialized. So basically, uh, basically what I'm saying here is that I've already pre-initialized the scanner with the keyboard variable and everything is set up to be used. So uh, basically we get our input and we can just say keyboard.next which would give us our input and then we want to uh, write a while loop and we want to make sure that a T or an H was inputted uh, so what we can do here is since we are getting a string here there's a few different ways to do it but if we were getting if we were using characters we would use the equals equals if we're using uh, strings we use the equals method to compare strings so if the input equals an H or the input equals a T that is what we want to check otherwise we want to have them keep inputting things so this would work great, except that I'm just making sure that they input at H or T and doesn't, I don't validate whether they have actually inputted either one of those valid values. So what we can do is change this a little. And what we want to do is So here what we're saying is uh, we're going to add falses to that. 
Um, basically, we're saying that we need the input to be either a true or a T and or an H. And if they're neither, then we need to ask the user to input again. So, what it, say if we enter an H, let's just go through the few combinations here. Our, our input for our keyboard was H. So input H equals H, which is true. So that would, true does not equal false. So that would be false, which would mean that the whole thing would be false and we would exit our loop, right? So we don't want false here. Uh, we would want true or equals h. So that would be if the input equals h, uh, that would be true. And let's say this was false, that would be false as well. Uh, or h equals t is. Uh, that would be false, so our thing would be not valid in here either. Okay, sorry about that. Um, basically, uh, we want to see here, this would only be true and inputted if the input was both H and T simultaneously. Uh, obviously that won't work um, and so what we need to do here is if we did or that means if the H or T was inputted we would go into here uh, but we want it to be not the case that they were inputted uh, basically there's a theorem called De Morgan's which would allow us to do something like this and but we can think about it also so uh, basically what we want to do is if while the input is not equal to H, so that's not, and the input is not equal to T, then it should go into here. Uh, so basically, let's think about this. Uh, I guess this would also work if, if we did do false here um, as well. Uh, and also here as well. So if our input is equal to H, that would equal true, which would cause us to uh, actually um, the and is much, or just doing the not is much simpler. So because that changes whatever our equals here is into from false to true or from true to false, which makes it much uh, simpler. So if our input is not equal to H, if it is equal to H, we would get here, H would be equal to true, which would change this to false, which would cause us to kick out. If our input, for example, T, uh, our input would equal, would not equal H, which would be false, so that would get set to true, and our input would equal to T here, that would be true, that would get set to false, which would also cause us to kick out, which is what we want. Now, if our input was i, what we would do is our input, i would get assigned to input, i is, equal, is not equal to h, so that would get set to tr false, which would get changed to true here, and i would not equal to t, which would get set to false, and that would then change to true. So true and true would cause us to go back into our while loop here, and then we would just simply do system out print and ask the user to please enter a valid value. And then we would get a new value from the user. So here, when we say validate, we want to make sure that the input they enter here is basically T or H before they go on to the next section. So this would be validate that the input 
was in fact a T or H before we could go, which makes our the rest of our processing a lot easier because we can assume that if this loop was successfully executed, that then in fact they entered the correct value of a T or an H. Okay, and in fact, uh, sorry, um, keep going back and forth on this, but this in fact would also work. It's just a little bit harder to think about in your head when you're uh, talking about it. But um, so if our input equals H, that is a true statement if we interpreted H, which would set this equal to false based upon equals equals false. So that statement would be false, which we would kick us out. If we didn't input an H, for example, a T, this what we would get is our input equals T would be false, which in fact becomes true because of the equals equals sign to false. Our T would then get checked over here. Our input would equal T, which is true, which does not equal false, which would set this thing to false. So our true and our false would cause us also to kick out for the T case. For the I case, or a different value, let's say uh, I, if our input does not equal H, which would be false, since it's equal to false, that would also that would be set this side of the statement to true. And I is not equal to T, so that would be set to false, which checked against false would also be true. So then true times true would be true, which would cause us to enter into here. Sorry, uh, the false and the true was throwing me off for a second there uh, with the Boolean algebra. Okay, so that's section three. Uh, our next section, which would be section uh, or question four is uh, basically, um, depending on what letter grade we entered, we would then uh, do a different thing. So I'm going to take off the example and just do uh, the, the problem. So let's, if we can assume that a scanner and keyboard variable are initialized, So just to save us a little time on that initialization step or steps. Um, so what we want to do is take in a letter grade and then output what value we want. So uh, we can do the same thing where we take in an input. So input equals keyboard.next. And then basically, uh, we want to basically do a series of if-else statements, or we can actually do a case statement, um, or yeah, sorry, we want to do a switch statement, since it does say a switch, to uh, figure out our grades. So because we can use strings in our case, this is pretty simple here. So switch our input. And then we simply want to do a few different case statements. So case, ah, case A, and then we can just do a system out print line 90 or higher. For example, and then one key thing about this is re make sure you put in your break statement. And again, Word is creating extra work here. Uh, let me delete this problem so I can have more room. So case B. Again, system out print line. Okay. 
So if you got B, you got somewhere between 80 and 90, or 89, 89.9, right? And break. And KC. Let me just copy that and change that. So KC, you've got between 70 and 79. And then I can do case D between 60 and 69. And then case F and this is just less than six than 59. And then finally, we should always add some sort of default one. Uh, and basically here, we don't know what they got. Uh, most likely, they just entered a bad value. And we can just say invalid value. And if we want, we could exit. Or we could just say, OK, they just entered a bad value, break, and continue with our program, whatever it's doing. So there's the state switch statement uh, based upon um, the different cases that we could have for this switch. Okay, uh, for this next problem, um, we just needed to use, we need to use J option pane. So um, I would expect you to at least know J option pane, uh, and then the show at least input dialog, um, and then the first parameter would be null, and then we would enter our string. Uh, so this would need to be enter your your first and last name again this re returns a string so I need to set this something name is equal to here and now I need to do some string manipulation um, assuming that the person just entered their first and last, there should be a space in the name. Therefore, we should be able to use index of and pull off the first and last name. Uh, so first we need to get the index of the space, or the determine where the space is. Uh, so int space will equal to be the name dot index of where the space is. So that's the thing, thing we're looking for. So we're going to look for a space. Uh, and then we need to pull out the first and last name. So we need to create a first name. And that will equal to uh, the name.substring of the f person's f name. So 0 to i. Uh, that space should be that per, uh, where the first space is here. So we're going to grab an extra character, or uh, i goes all the way up to i minus 1, so we don't actually grab i with our substring method, which should be good, since it should be the last letter of the uh, first name. And we need to also grab the last name. So here we want to go one letter past that. And so it's i plus 1. And if we don't supply a second parameter, uh, it just goes to the end of the string. So this should grab the last name. Then we just need to create one final j option pane. I believe it's show message dialog. 
to let the know, user know that it's just some message. Oops. First parameter is null. And the second parameter is uh, we just want to put the first name first and the last name uh, second. So we can just simply do last name plus uh, add the comma in there since that's what it states plus uh, first name and that should output what we want the user to see so we enter the first and last name and then we just pull off the last name put that first and add the first name um, so yeah that one uh, should be a pretty or here is pretty straightforward. Uh, it's just doing some string manipulations and using our substring method and index of in the string class to uh, work with our string here. Here we want to write a simple program that figures out the largest of three numbers. So um, this asks us to write a program so we should probably write the full thing um, out so import oops remember we should need to import our java util scanner class uh, public class average for example Maybe I should supply you guys with this uh, template stuff so it's easier for you guys. Uh, public static void main string args here. And uh, then we want to take in uh, the variables. So we create our keyboard class here. Um, again, this asks for a whole program, so these are just asking for the code snippets. So, uh, or these are just asking for the code snippets, so it's a little bit, sh should be a lot shorter than a full program which we need. So, you still need to remember how to do this. So, system in. Sorry if you hear my cat. Um, in the background. Okay, so we have our keyboard. Uh, next we're going to get our numbers. So, um, it's hard to write in this word here. So, int num1 equals keyboard dot next int num2 and num3 so num2 and then num3 here Okay, uh, so now we have our three numbers, and now we need to compute some way to figure out the largest. Um, basically, the way I like to do it is to uh, find the maximum um, and then compare the numbers to the maximum. Um, essentially, it will always be changing a variable max so let's just assume right off the bat that one of them is the maximum number one and then we could go through and basically compare the second versus the current max so if um, num2 is greater than the max then in fact num2 is the max right so max equals num2 
Okay, so, but we also have number three to compare, so let's just compare if number three is greater than the max. If num3 is greater than the max, then num3 is the max. Now, if they're equal, you don't really need to consider that due to the fact that, uh, for example, let's say we entered instead of 5, 6, 12, we entered 5, 5, 12, uh, or 5, 12, 12. That's a little bit more interesting. Uh, 5, 12, 12 would give us, we would set the max first to 5, then we would see 12 is greater than the max, which we would set 12 equal to the max, and then we would say, if number 3 was also 12, 12 is greater than the max. It's not technically so, uh, but it's actually the same, but it's already set to the max, so num3 would be the value, or that would be the same as num2, which would be the maximum value. So we're good there as well. Um, for this case, though, on the general case, and what we see on the example is that num3 is greater, so max equals num3. Once we're done with that, we can just print out what our maximum is. The max input, the maximum number, number is, and we can just print out what our max is. And then we just need to simply close up the parentheses here. Again, it's going to be funky on me due to the fact that this is Word. Okay, so that would be our simple program for figuring out the greatest uh, of our inputs. <sighs> okay, so here's our truth table one. Um, I'm actually going to switch over to Excel um, and do that over here in Excel just because it's a little easier keeping the columns and everything in order. So we want to do uh, a basically a four column truth table. So I'm going to set up four columns here, A, B, C, and D. And then um, I'm going to do this in the zero way. So uh, basically this is zero, 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 zero. And then zero, 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 one then 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. Then this is 0, 1, 0, 0. Again, remember, zeros are false and ones are true. 0, 1, 0, 1. 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, and then 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, uh, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, and then finally 1, 1, 1, 1. And we should be able to do this and see that we have 16 values, which uh, based upon our uh, two to the n inputs is correct. So here I'm going to do my first column after that, I'm going to do A and B. So the only way that A and B can work is if both A and B are ones. So we see that these guys are all zeros because A is all zero here. Here we see that A is one here, but Bs are zero, so that's not good. So the only place where we get ones are these last four rows here. So 
I'm going to set that to 1, 1, 1, 1, and then go back to the top and fill the rest out with zeros. Next, I'm going to do not C and D. So not C and D. Uh, one easy thing that you can do uh, is if you wanted to do not C, what you could do is create a column called not C and do that calculation first, just to make it a little easier so that you guys can see. So this would be 1, 1. 0, 0, 1, 1, a 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. And that makes then this calculation between C and D much easier. So not C and D can be true only when both not C and D are 1. So this is 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. Um, and then finally, what we want to do is the combination of both this guy or with what we just calculated with not C and D this guy so it's these two columns so basically uh, because this is an or statement only column this column has to have a one or this column has to have a one or they both have to have a one so uh, go, just go down the list and looking for ones so this is zero one zero 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 one zero 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 one zero zero one, 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 one. So here's our output for our truth table, which would be 16 lines here. Okay, finally, um, this was a problem. Uh, it was a little confusing for people, and um, I guarantee you that this one won't be on the test uh, but basically it's a few different if statements and else uh, the other statements than that um, so basically it's an if else then statement um, basically you can kind of see some of the logic uh, Basically, you would calculate the WCI first, and then based upon the other inputs, you would do different things. Um, so the wind chill index is basically calculated from these values, which is the you would take in the speed, wind speed, and the temperature, and this is pretty much the code for that. So if the wind speed is between 0 and 4 then you would just say the wind chill index is equal to T if the wind ch if the speed of the wind is greater than 45 miles an hour then we add in some factor here otherwise we do this complicated equation to get the wind chill index for values between 4 and 45 um, and then based upon the wind chill index, if our WCI is greater than 80 or the humidity is greater than or equal to 90, we would wear in outfit one. If the wind chill index is less than zero and the chance of rain is less than 70, we would wear outfit two. Then we would check if the humidity is less than or equal to 20 and the wind chill is between 30 and 70. We would basically do outfit three and then outfit four would be basically anything else. So it was it basically first you get compute the wind chill index of these values using these uh, different equations. Remember this one here, you would need to break it up into two separate statements one for the greater than zero case 
uh, up to four, from zero to f four, that requires two sets. So you need to make sure the wind's greater than zero, and then you also need to make sure that the wind is less than four, or less than or equal to four. Um, and then you would just compute the wind chill index as that e value of equal to T. Uh, basically, we would then do all the various calculations based upon that and based upon the input of humidity and rain. We would then do these different outputs again into a win if else, if else, else if statements. So um, basically, this was checking the, that and also doing um, a bunch of of calculations in our code. Um, again, this kind of confused a lot of people, so this is definitely has been replaced by something a little bit more manageable. However, uh, feel free to work it um, if you'd like. Okay, so I believe that's pretty much everything on the test. Um, some scratch paper. Um, again, if you guys have any questions or problems, uh, let me know. Uh, and uh, good luck, um, and I'll see you on Monday.